So we'd like to welcome you to today's program. Um, I am Ritu, the director of the Dharamsala International Film Festival. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, about 10 years ago, along with my partner, Tenzing Sonam, we started the Dharamsala International Film Festival. Uh, this is where we live. And the idea was to do something uh, meaningful for the community because there wasn't any uh, contemporary cultural events over here. Um, but surprisingly for us, the festival grew much more than we expected. And it became a place for you know, film lovers from around the country to come and to watch films. So uh, that's sort of how we started. And this is now coming on to our 10th year now. So we are hitting our 10th edition this year. Um, last year, we were in a real state because, of course, as you know, the pandemic hit us all. And at that time, we decided immediately in March itself to show some films online because we realized so many people are, you know, would like to watch these films and don't have the opportunity. So we started a viewing room last year itself. And this year, we've actually decided to have a virtual viewing room throughout the year. And we're trying to have curated programs from around the world as part of this. And so the Films of Bunuel is part of our virtual viewing room. And we're very, very happy to be able to bring this program to you because, uh, you know, as filmmakers ourselves, we've been influenced by Bunuel. We've seen many of his films and we feel, feel that, you know, for young people, to watch films of Bunuel in India, but also for people to get to know him again, people who may have watched his films to view them again is a great opportunity. So we would like to thank very much uh, the Embassy of Spain um, and uh, the Institute Salantis uh, to make this possible. And uh, I think that's, that's all I would like to say for now. I would like to introduce you to uh, the head of the Institute Cervantes, who is with me right now. Uh, it's Oscar Pohol. And would you please say a few words? Um, yes. Thanks, Ritu. Um, it's for me a, a, a real pleasure to be here today at this, at this edition of the Dharamsala International Film Festival online. And, and a real pleasure to say a few words on behalf of the Spanish Embassy and the Instituto Cervantes of New Delhi. On the occasion of this Buñuel retrospective, which you have very beautifully named Enigma and Provocation, the cinema of Luis Buñuel. So I would like to begin by thanking you, Ritu Sarin, director and founder of Daram Sala Film Festival, also Dipti Pendurti, manager of the festival for making this possible. And there is for me no need to say that the Dharamsala International Film Festival has completely changed the cultural landscape of Dharamsala, a beautiful city, by the way, which I visited a long time ago, in fact. And also, and that's even more important, it has become one of the most sought after film festivals of India, earning also a solid reputation abroad. I have also to mention and to thank the Embassy of Spain, especially in the persons of Montserrat Pampillo, which is the Charge des Affaires of the Spanish Embassy, and also Alonso Pérez Hernández, its first secretary. And I also have to thank Martí Basset, the cultural manager of the Instituto Cervantes, and Bikash Taman, also from the Instituto Cervantes, from, for their contribution. I think there are Five films that have been going to be shown here, very important ones like Viridiana, El Angel Exterminador, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Vel de Jour, among others. No? But of course, I want to speak about Luis Buñuel now myself, no? because I think there are people which are much more capable than me to, of doing so, much more. And I would like, in this, in, in, in this sense, you know, to greet David Felipe Arranz. He's a Hispanic philologist, journalist, and professor of communications and journalism at Carlos III University of Madrid. And he collaborates in several media like newspapers, radio, and television. And also to greet Aisha, Aisha Git Abbas, an independent researcher 
who has done a lot of work at the National Film Archives of India, and who is currently working on the history of silent cinema in India. I say that I want to speak about Luis Buñuel. And Luis Buñuel, you know, for all the Spaniards, we carry him really deep in our heart. He taught us not only how to watch movies, but also how to understand cinema in a deep sense. But I would like to mention, you know, a lesser known fact about Buñuel, at least outside Spain. Buñuel was born in Calanda, which is a village from the province of Teruel in Spain. During Easter, on Good Friday, there is a unique celebration in the town of Calanda, a massive non-stop beating of drums for 24 hours. At noon on Good Friday, after a given signal, called in Spanish, rompida de la hora, or breaking of the hour, thousands of drummers come together in the village square and at midday, they begin to beat in unison, filling the whole village with an incredible sound. The drums beat, as I said, non-stop for 24 hours and the drummers get really tired. It's a really a, an incredible exercise. And the rumble and roar serve us to remind of the darkness that sees the earth at the death of the Christ. At the same time, the beating of the drum, it's a therapeutic experience to release the pain of death and darkness. Buñuel was very fond of this event as a child when he was living there, but even in his adult life, when he was living abroad, he went several times to his village to participate in this ceremony. And you can see very nice pictures of him beating the drums at, Calan at Calanda. In fact, Buñuel spoke full of emotion of these drums in his memoirs, My Last Sight. Moreover, he used the deep and unforgettable drum roll of these drums in several of his films. And we can fancy that his films are also like this drum roll in exposing all the pain that religious and social hypocrisy cause in our life. And also a way of overcoming them by beating of the drums in the form of filmmaking. Luis Buñuel was not a city man. He described himself as a redneck from Aragon. And as I said, he was born in the village of Calanda. And I was just today trying to imagine Buñuel in Dharamsala. I am sure he would love a place like Dharamsala. And I would just close this remarks by saying that from Calanda to Dharamsala, long life to the art of Luis Buñuel and long life to the Dharamsala International Film Festival. Let the drums begin to beat. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much, Oscar. I hope we can welcome you here for our 10th edition, which is this year in November. We are definitely going to go online, but if things improve in the country, we are thinking also of considering a hybrid festival, in which case, you know, you would be most welcome. In fact, we would love to have you here. I would love to come in November. So let's no. cross our fingers and hope it's going to happen. And of course, as you mentioned, Alfonso Perez from the embassy was the person we first dealt with throughout the whole time. And he was the most supportive person to us. And I hope he will come to along with some of the others who we don't know at the embassy. Um, I will now like to hand over uh, to David and to Aisha. I think your introduction's already been done. So please now take it on and we will leave you and our audiences to have a great kind of time together and ask questions and enjoy the last few days that we have of these five films online. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we can sort of start off from the tone that Oscar has set off for us about Kalanda and the drums. And uh, David, maybe one thing we could talk about was, uh, without uh, doubt, Buñuel had a very picaresque journey of his own when it comes to making films. And uh, even though uh, the films that we have 
uh, been watching in this retrospective are from his later period, one must not forget the kind of spectra of Spain. It's very limiting to talk about him only as a Spanish filmmaker, but one can also never forget the fact that he comes from a place where when he talks about Kalanda, you, the, I, the, the Middle Ages, the, the fact that the Middle Ages, in a sense, the, the way death is experienced, the way religion is experienced, he talks about this in his memoirs and how that has found a way into his films right from the early surrealism of, of uh, with Dali to uh, his later films that you have watched in the uh, retrospective. So uh, even with the drums of Kalanda playing in Simon of the Desert in, in his Mexican period, or uh, or you see the bells in, in Toledo in uh, Tristana, all these you see, you can sort of connect them, bring them back to his, his early years in Kal Kalanda and Saragossa. So maybe you could uh, speak to us about this influence of Spain and how Spain appears in various ways in his films. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, and Ritu and Oscar and my friend. Uh, we are going to approach uh, a unique figure, uh, and you say the, the origin of Kalanda, but uh, Buñuel is uh, one example of uh, a Spanish movie maker that uh, where he was born and Spain in a special way of living, the picaresque you say, because uh, Oscar knows very well and you too, we have a tradition in picaresque unique in the world. Uh, all the novels of picaresque, this picaresque way of living, of teaching, stealing, of doing very bad things to the others, the picaresque tradition. And Cervantes, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, began with these little novels, the exemplary novels, about two little rascals that is a picaresque way of living. Well, Puñuel was born and educated in this context that sit the age door. Uh, he was filming in an age door film and he reminds this way unique and I think it's irreplaceable. Only in Spain occurs these things. Little and young rascals doing picaresque way of living. I think this is a great influence. Of course, this is Calanda, and but it's uh, it forms part of the Spanish culture. Uh, even I think it's more important that his adherence to surrealism, his political commitment, his relationship with Catholicism, his Mexican style, but above all, uh, he connects his spirit creator, connects with all this tradition of greatest genius of literature that were writing, for example, Francisco de Quevedo, El Buscón, the king of picaresque, that little boy named Don Pablos that in the, that age door in 17th century was trying to survive in a very hard world. So Buñuel, at his way, was a picaresque one and he learned all the ways in order to survive in uh, a very difficult world. Even he survives all different periods of the 20th century because his work, and, and you know very well, covers the history of our cinema. Avant-garde, silent cinema, documentary size that you told me you like very much, the documentary looking of Buñuel, the Mexican melodrama that the Mexican melodrama drinks of our literature. For example, Benito Perez Galdós, one of Buñuel's favorite writers, uh, adaptation of great novels. And his last period, very, very interesting, is the French cinema of the 70s. How he connected with all this tradition and he makes his work absolutely unique in the world and very rich. And uh, talking about literature and again, uh, sort of bringing in his life, his, his, 
sort of life in exile and meeting all these very important figures, not just in uh, literature, but painting and music and psychoanalysis. And so if you could talk about how his uh, associations with various literary figures, uh, the generation of 27 or ultras, the, the group of ultras that he belonged to and how in a sense, they, he was very particular about stressing the fact that in a way they preceded the surrealists of, of France, right? So maybe you could talk a little bit about his, uh, his relationship with literature and, yeah. and how it influenced him. This is my dear friend, absolutely, definitely in a creator of Luis Buñuel, his uh, sons in residence of students. It's a very important institution in Spain, in Madrid of freedom because we are talking about a period between 1916 and 1924, several years, very important, not only for Luis Buñuel, but for example, Federico García Lorca, maybe our most international of our writers and, and poets. And the other is Salvador Dalí, a very friend of him, the greatest painter. So, he was friend of them, and he was uh, at the beginning. He was very with many doubts about uh, studying agronomy or studying natural science or even entomology. It it is connected with his obsession with animals yeah. and spiders, and he he loved entomology and of course uh, philosophy. He loves yeah. philosophers. So this period is very, very important because uh, the image, the image in uh, in filming of Luis Buñuel is like, and, and you note it is in uh, our conversation. And you told me there is something very rude in Luis Buñuel. Of mm. course there is, because this is a strange case because he make a like a gross poetic images. It's very hard. Is a bleeding maybe or images of death and very radical images. This the, it belongs to avant-garde poetics, and he learned here in this period because he has intuitive images that are united with the unpredictable and instantaneous impulse of desire of the creatures, desire of the animals, desire of donkeys, desire of ants, and and he's obsessed with that. So. Desire, I think, in this period is so important to the young Buñuel that, uh, he, for example, an Andalusian dog, Un Perro Andaluz, or The Golden Age, that uh, are the first films of this period, because he learned of, of these poetic images from a very important cinematographer that the name is, you know it, Jean Epstein, yeah. a French cinematographer, and uh, La Chute de la Maison Usher, that you know it's an adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe, terrific, uh, terrific literature oh, and he loved. And he was the assistant of this film. And he is joining uh, the obscure images of death and decadence with his own obsessive images. So he, in this period, he's writing in a two very important uh, magazines, La Gaceta Literaria, okay, and Le Cahiers d'Art. So we have another influence of art and literature of surrealist avant-garde in France at this period. And we have his own Calanda original obsessions, picaresque, you noticed before, poof, it's a, it's a, a three, six, oh, grades, everything complete in the career formation of Luis Buñuel. Yeah. And one cannot help but think really it is also his experiences, his, his mad life in a sense, you know, where his, his visuals of what he sees in a symmetry with his sister as a child is as important as say a fight he has with someone in a bar, you know, all these are as important to him as images, you know. Yeah. as anything else and uh, before uh, we talk uh, i would just like to ask the uh, participants to write in their questions in the chat section 
right? Okay. And then we can get back to them later. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So yeah, uh, David, maybe you should go on a little more about his uh, his uh, early adventures with the uh, with the. Uh, besides Dali, when he comes to France, he meets Breton and he meets all of them, and it's very interesting how their ideas of surrealism are 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 always are. There's an interesting combative nature also between all of these these early pioneers of surrealism. So it is interesting to see how. Within surrealism itself, there are differing uh, attitudes. So maybe you can talk about that a bit. It's a uh, point very interesting because we have a um, conflictive relationship between Buñuel and Salvador Dali. Because yeah. not only the influence of one to another, but finally uh, they cut the relation. It's very strange, very rare because uh, he wrote in 1929 with Salvador Dalí, uh, Un Perro Andaluz, the an Andalusian dog. They were together, uh, very uh, united, very close friends. And nowadays, uh, experts and uh, studies don't, they don't know which part belongs to Dali, which part belongs to <laughs> Luis Buñuel. This is something confusion. So united they were, they, ve they were very close friends. So uh, at, this, at this time, 1929, uh, they were at the surrealist group with this movie for the first time. They incorporated themselves to the, that incredible movement, but just, only one year later, in 1930, he broke with the league. They, they had a, a, an argue very, very hard. So uh, he directed H. Door like something, an answer to his friend Ali to explain his point of view. So the, the film, Le H. Door, or the H. Door, uh, they put uh, the film in Paris. Uh, it was a very great scandal, incredible, with intervention of police and even <laughs> even uh, the commissar Chiape in in Paris uh, accused him of public disorderly. <laughs> it was <laughs> incredible, uh, and so Buñuel went to the states for this scandal. And, and we are uh, talking about uh, 1931. And so, we must not forget the fact he tried to choke Dali's. Yeah. It, was really, it was really incredible because the rational impulse of Luis Buñuel uh, was uh, very, very, very big. So I think this, this relationship is very, very important. And at the same time, very, very conflictive. And I don't understand why uh, they went wrong within with between them. Uh, even nowadays, we don't know really what happened between them. Yeah. And talking about surrealism, we can I think move on to the films that we watched. Uh, one of the things that he talks about is the pleasure of dreaming, and he always says that this pleasure he got from dreaming dreaming was a, was one of the most important things he shared with the other surrealists. So maybe we could talk about dreams and the way dreams appear in, in his films. You are right, because uh, for Buñuel, um, dreaming uh, like a way of surrealism, like a way of realization of art, opposites are possible. Maybe the possibility that even your nightmare, they are realized. So. Opposites for Buñuel are possible. Even simultaneous solution emerge at the same time from which not only the filmmaker, but also the viewer, also the publics that they think that things maybe happen like nightmares over there. So uh, it also shows what could have happened to the characters rather than what actually happened to them always a possibility on even those films. Buñuel makes both the time and the evocation of what has not been collected in the film appear. So uh, in many interviews, Buñuel always points out carefully all the moments in which his life has taken a definite direction. 
while an objective chance could have made it bifurcate towards different one. He continues to marvel at all the lives that could have been equally in his stem of the one he lived. So we have the real life and we have at the same time a parallel dream or even nightmare life. And it is true that his path was especially winding and abandoned to the vicissitude of history, to the friendships found the countries and Buñuel, uh, the work of Buñuel, and you pointed it very well, is supported by a tension between open eyes and closed eyes. Open eyes is the reality, the political situation, the social situation, and the closed eyes when he's writing, when he's dreaming with his closed eyes, refer, for example, one of uh, his friends, Octavio Paz, quoted at the conference in Mexico in 1953, and he said, Octavio Paz, it's enough for a man in chains to close his eyes for him to explode the world. So the cinema was for Buñuel the ideal instrument that allowed him through his life and without contradictions to make the world explode, of course, surrealistic with his eyes closed and to render accounts to the world with his eyes open. Mm -hmm. This is a, yeah. a metaphor way of living and dreaming surrealistic way. Yeah. Uh, and if I may add something, one of the uh, things that when Dali and he, when they were working on the earlier films, was that when they would play these games, and games being such an important part of these movements, was that, you know, they would accept images that could only have irrational exp explanations, that couldn't be explained rationally. And dreams for him in that way is a space where all these contradictions, it didn't matter. It, it, in a sense, he it's like dreams are the original images. And then these films that he makes are the, the uh, a sort of understanding or trying to uh, uh, imagine these dreams in, in, in celluloid. So uh, for instance, even something as, um, one thing that most people talk about Buñuel's films is also his uh, his extreme, in cases, violent critique of the church or, or the clergy or uh, the bourgeoisie. But, but there's this very lovely uh, thing he talks about, a dream, a dream he has of the Virgin Mary and where he completely, in an irrational way, experiences some kind of ethereal, you know, beauty. And, and that is the space where all these contradictions can, can survive, you know? Mm. And uh, yeah, I so think, that's... I think there's uh, something important that, uh, for example, we have another um, filmmaker, very important. We are celebrating uh, 100 years of his birth. He's, maybe you, you know him, is Luis Garcia Berlanga. Mm -hmm. Luis García Berlanga, at the same time of, of Luis Buñuel, he never uses, or maybe sometime, but not usually, oniric images. Because Luis García Berlanga, uh, he makes the uh, satirical film of way. He, he's filming, for example, all the uh, rascals in Madrid, all the rascals in... Uh, Alicante coast of Valencian coast, and in a very realistic way, la picaresque. But Buñuel, this is the difference, uh, for his adherence to surrealism, uh, he's making, and, and you notice this very well, this political commitment, but in a very uh, creative way, in a very poetical way. So the uh, censorship at the time uh, was very crowded because they say, what does he mean? What is the meaning of that, these images? And, and in, even the clergymen or the Catholicism critics, they didn't understand <laughs> what Buñuel want to, want to mean with those images. So they, di they didn't find an explanation for these films and maybe, oh, he's absolutely crazy, let him. Uh, he's in the uh, United States, he's in Mexico, he's in France. Okay, let's forget it. And uh, Buñuel, it was like uh, that typical crazy genius that even uh, the, the, the Catholic Church 
didn't consider him because they say, well, he's uh, very nuts. He's absolutely a different movie maker and he's doing different things. But with other filmmakers, yes. as you say, for example, uh, Garcia Berlanga or the other uh, I love is Basilio Martin Patino, a very, very important documentary filmmaker in Spain. They were very watching him all the Catholical watching him about what they wrote. But Buñuel was like an asteroid flying uh, uh, because you know that Buñuel only uh, directed five films in Spain and the rest of his filmography, it's uh, in all over the world. So yes. he was not uh, very in the point of looking of the Inquisition here. Yeah, it's a great position of the fool, right? I can laugh at you, but you can't punish me because I'm laughing at you. I'm a fool at the end of it all. Yeah. So it's that he utilized that position very to great advantage in that sense. Yeah, it's a position very creative. It's just yeah. a position uh, with very advantage yes. to other filmmakers that were denounced concrete actions or concrete political uh, yeah. dictatorship of Franco, but Buñuel is at that poetical level that was surrounding all over the real action. But at the same time, at the same point, he was making a hard critic to this politics, but yeah. Yeah. in a dissimulative way, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Because there is a lot of brutal violence in, in, the, in the Mexican films and all. a lot of it becomes funny when it is transported to the bourgeois dining room, but at the end, the violence is still there, right? Yeah, so. it, it, it began in, in 1950, you say about that violence with Los Olvidados, The Forgotten, one of my favorite films I've got here with me every day, The Forgotten, it's one, it's one of my favorite one. Yes. And, and it, it is connected with all our little rascal boys of yes. the Franco dictatorship that were hungry, that died. And he was interested before in uh, Las Urdes, Tierra Sin Pan, Las Urdes, land without bread. And it was an experiment yeah, because, look, it was in 1933, Las Urdes. Yeah. And uh, it couldn't open the film because it was considered an insult for Spain. In 1933, imagine in 1950, a film like Los Olvidados about the same issue, about the childhood perverted by a society that struggles that little babies. So Los Olvidados, uh, even there in Mexico, uh, Mexican journalists accused to Buñuel of lying, of uh, making an exaggerated film. And uh, he had the same problems in Mexico with Los Olvidados mm -hmm. that in Spain with Las Urdes in 1933. And this is what you say, Everybody likes Buñuel in any place in the world because he approaches eternal problems of human beings, even the childhood. Yes, and that very casual killing of the child in Los Alvedados, etc. Yeah. So very different, the desert films in a sense were quite... Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here. Mm, the question here, Anish Srikumar. Hi, uh, Anish. Uh, in the discrete charm of the bourgeoisie, the so-called bourgeois uh, are seen walking on a tarmac, mm. endlessly under a scorching sun without a destination in sight. What was the meaning of that? Can you please discuss more about some scenes which could be open to interpretation in the movie? The movie was amazing, shocking, and confusing all at the same time, at the same time. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorite movie because um, at the basis of Buñuel, of his imaginary, a man wishes a woman violently. The desire, the image of desire, the instantaneous impulse of desire, of sexuality of his creatures. Desire is, is very important to, to Buñuel because 
the discredit in, in hand of burgundy is about the hypocrisy of uh, men and women dressed absolutely so gallant and, and so ideal, but inside them there is something brutal and sexual and impulsive and at the last moment everything explodes it's up, it, and, and the surrealistic uh, item of Luis Buñuel enters there. So we have the social critics of the high society and the surrealistic and Freudian and sexual impulse of all people that are stand in front of a table eating so elegant and so gallant. But inside everybody of them, there is something uh, obscure and the object of desire. This is the interpretation of uh, that wonderful film. Yeah, and it is it is slightly more charming than say the exterminating angel in the sense the people are there is some comedy to it, and uh, what is very interesting is also he's always the the political uh, uh, scenario the conditions of the time are always reflected in his films now even even the fact that he was all there is uh, uh, that idea of the metic the exile of how the Spaniard exile. Uh, works in these French circles. You see the, the minister of uh, Miranda, the ambassador of Miranda played by Fernando Rey, how he's in that party and they tell him, but we have heard in Miranda, they just take out guns and they shoot people and there is bribery and corruption. And within seconds, you have that happening in a French jail too. And also the May 68 uh, uh, student protest, there is a sort of uh, small reference to that with that whole uh, Miranda's, the students were coming to bomb or uh, to, to shoot him or to bomb his place. Or, so yes. there is an always an alert awareness of what is happening around it. Maybe a slight cynicism also about uh, certain uh, utopic uh, ideas of, of, you know, what communism, for instance, even that, like. Yes, and also uh, one of his friends uh, that uh, begins with, uh, with, for example, Viridiana, we are talking about the, the last period of Buñuel films. I mean, from 1960 to 1977, we have the French period of Luis Buñuel. And all things you are saying about political connection, the subject of students, the subject of the character of Fernando Rey, and all that, there is a, a very important name in his uh, cinematography, that is Jean-Claude Carrier. Jean-Claude yes. Carrier co-writes with him all these wonderful films yes. since uh, Diario de una Camarera, Diary of a Quaitress in 1963, uh, with the producer Serge Sieberman that pays the money to make the movie, and Jean-Claude Carrier, it's like uh, these three people, producer Silverman, writer Jean-Claude Carrier, director Luis Buñuel, they make this kind of movies, this is special of thinking about burguesy and the Francis period, the French period, this is, I think, very, very interesting. It's more complex. He yeah. is the decantation of all his influence before. And I love this, these French movies. Yeah. Uh, we can... Uh... Hello of the films that Rahul Ghosh. Hi, Rahul. Hello of the films that were available to view. The absence of non diegetic music was a peculiar observation. Apart from the opening credits, what can be the possible reason? Does it have something to do with his relation with music? Well, he was going deaf in his final years. That is. Well, we know that uh, Buñuel was. Uh, had a problem with ear, yeah. you know, and uh, maybe at the beginning, some some say that in Kalanda dreams uh, yeah. striking was uh, very soundy for him, and yeah. he's uh, he's right, uh, he's right when when he says uh, the uh, the relation of Buñuel with music is not normal because 
uh, he wants to hear uh, sounds of nature, sounds even of uh, the objects, for example, the chair, for example, the knives in Viridiana, the knives, yeah. in the forks, yeah. uh, in the, the, the laughs of that rascals yeah. and the people, he prefers even the, the chanting of birds or even the sound of, uh, of wine yeah. or even whatever. And yeah. he's right, the absence of music in the, the, in the movie, in the script is very notable. Yeah, with the exception, if, and exterminating angel, there is some very interesting sound designing happening there with, with you know the the animals, and then you have a uh, piano playing. I think in the, the case of uh, say Tristana, and even in the exterminating angel, you have these women who play the piano and some Wagner. I, I think uh, yes, I think it becomes because he always was a. Uh, uh, silent movie maker, even yeah. even in his French uh, uh, period, but he's thinking like Charlie Chaplin in a silence uh, way of filmmaking. Of uh, uh, the images is more important than the sound for me. Yeah. I think the images, yeah, right. Uh, the next question. Sai Sagar, could you talk about something about the motif of bells and his fascination with it, and also Buñuel's fascination with shoes? Uh, bells, yeah, even in uh, Tristana, there's that scene where she goes up and they play the bells. And there is this beautiful passage in his memoir where he talks about the different sounds of the bells, you know, some is more melancholic than the other, something is more chirpy than the other. But yeah, David, maybe you could say something. Well, uh, the bells during centuries in Spain, in all villages, even in great capitals at the front of the church, is like an absolutely reality and marks the day after day of people and generation from generation. I mean, even in the Middle Ages, the bells mm -hmm. with cathedrals, with great churches. And Buñuel loved all these context, uh, religious contests uh, in villages, in church. For example, Toledo, you know, in Tristana, the sound of bells always upsets him and accompanies him all his life. And for the part of the shoes, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Luis García Berlanga, uh, he loves uh, of this fetishist object. Uh, the shoes, the skirts, uh, uh, maybe all the things about women dressing. Oh, he was absolutely obsessed. Even in Viridiana, when Fernando Rey uh, is very close to the Silvia Pinal body, he's yeah. absolutely fetishist. Yeah. So I think the shoes, at this case, is fetishism of the Luis Muñuel, absolutely crazy about erotism in the objects, the objects yes. that were a lady, for example. Hair also, something I feel uh, Hitchcock yeah. later <laughs> picks up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. But yeah. Okay. Uh, anonymous. Okay, hi. Uh, in both Tristana and Viridiana, there is an older man trying to form a relation with a younger woman. Yet for some reason, I felt that in Tristana, the character played by Fernando Rey was a lot like Viridiana, not in their ideologies, but how they transition throughout the film. Viridiana also succumbs and at the end has given up her religion, even if it was a sham to begin with, and then gives into the seductions of her, her uh, And the same happens to Don Lope. He starts off as a stubborn atheist, but till the end, you see him dining with the clergyman. Well, uh, in Spain, it was like that. Yeah. Benito Perez Galdós uh, wrote many, many stories about all men. And it was a reality when uh, in uh, the villages in all the Spain, maybe in Spain in 19th century or even at the beginning of 20th century, uh, there was like an hypocrisy. 
because uh, in front of church, in front of clergymen, there was the faith, there was the believing in commandments, there was the respect, some kind of hypocrisy with all donatives to church, the burgess uh, chiefs of a village, but uh, they always laugh. Uh, we have another writer, Juan Valera, with many of his novels, even the own uh, Benito Perez Galdós wrote about these stories about old men with uh, young women that uh, there was a rare relationship that even not nowadays is very common, but in our classic literature from our realistic tradition, many stories, and of course, Buñuel noticed it and he loved to film that stories that really happened in that Spain of the time, very weird and very strange um, and uh, very erotical stories. Uh, I think as a continuation of this, we can also read this okay. question. Uh, I just saw, how much really did Buñuel follow and adopt Sigmund Freud's research? His portrayal of women seemed to be more of psychological disturbed than sexually liberated. Can you please elaborate? Well, uh, about portrait of, of women, I think, uh, as I said, the, the poetics of, of desire, and it uh, has to, to do with uh, this uh, point of view about, about women, it's part of his I told before the gross poetic image, the root poetic image of Luis Buñuel. So we must thinking about this time, imagine how in Spain of 30s, 40s, 15, of course it, it was evolutionating. It's not the same treatment of women maybe in 1970s of Buñuel films done in 1950s in Mexico, there is an, an evolution because uh, the desire about women, about objects of desire, for example, in uh, Simón del Desierto, Simon of the Desert, one of your favorite films, um, women, for example, is like the object of temptation, is the image of devil, the image of hell. And uh, mm, uh, the hero, that is Simon, uh, he loves her, but he won't, he, he don't want to love her. There's a, a like a shocking uh, inside him. And uh, suddenly, Belle de Jour, for example, uh, we have a point of view of uh, two faces in the women. Uh, in the morning, in the day, uh, Catherine Deneuve is an ideal lady, a respectable lady, and there's some kind of revenge of this lady in the night. Uh, freedom, absolutely sadomasochistic, uh, war practice, he changed, he changed at the other side. So uh, he has a, a construction of a dual image of women in the character of Catherine Deneuve that you know is one of his favorite actress. And maybe this image that con constructed and, and built Luis Buñuel in Catherine Deneuve was all the life of Catherine Deneuve persuading her at the last of his films. Mm -hmm. so, so potentially was that way of building the image of, of, of women with this two ways of looking at them. Yeah. Anisha has also asked another question about Belle de Jour. I just want to add one thing. Uh, uh, a thing that uh, surrealists at that time, they were quite uh, uh, emphatic about was the fact that the weapon they had was scandalization. You know, the scandal was the weapon they could use most effectively. And in this case, even though in, in uh, whether it be Viridiana, where you see the same man who is who's painting her and calling her as pure as the Virgin Mary is the same man who attempts to rape her. Or in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, Belle de Jour, or you see that very roughness that, that sort of, you know, uh, push, pushing around the woman and all of that. 
at the same time you see the men characters also in a sense extremely emasculated they are uh, uh, the defining sort of emotion uh, for most of these characters whether in viridiana or in uh, 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 tristana beldejour are they are pathetic the husband of beldejour is this man who is not able to uh, uh, make his wife desire him so you have this very interesting use of scandal also is this what you expect me to uh, uh, film a conventional man woman relationship no i'm going to shock you a bit so there is that element to it uh, and there is this uh, point they always put forth which is that scandal is the way you reveal you reveal the problems with society whether it be the political structure the church having too much influence on your lives or man who misogyny all of these cracks are revealed to you through this this tool of scandal through this tool of provocation like our thing thing is is named yeah yes and and i think this in origin because all that society in spain from 40s to 70s that is the period of production of luis buñuel the society was sexually repressed yes so, um, when man uh, uh, desires a, a woman uh, he begins to speculate he begins to schemes uh, to achieve his sense and how to get her and um, look at this at the last moment when she is at his mercy uh, he finds himself possessed by a completely rational sex impulse so uh, that of not achieving his sense because that characters of men in spain didn't achieve his sense his his goals yeah. how they were repressed conflictiv sexually conflictic affection and they were turning on into a crazy wall of sexually affections repressed so you are right because in this sense uh, this is representative very representative of humor or even mm -hmm. journalist of this period because we had many reviews uh, about for example we have another one very important writer francisco umbral that wrote about this uh, impossible relationship between the object of desire and the man who desires that women yeah. very beautiful blonde with the hair with the shoes with the breast with everything and uh, he never achieve these goals and it makes like a, a repression statement yeah because even even katrin denov even yeah. when she is um uh, working at yeah. at the place she is still in a sense very immaculate in her givenchy and her and her certain you know that that uh the glazed thing is is she still immaculate in a lot of ways yeah uh and masochism you know it's not just uh, uh katrin denov who's masochistic in in, uh, in his films simon of the desert is masochistic too you know he's denying himself his pleasure so it's it's like there is a sense of <laughs> democracy there i guess but um questions uh, malika patel i uh, asks i understand that most things can be analyzed politically but is it correct to watch bunuel's films from a feminist lens or will that dilute the cinematic quality of his films because as mentioned it does seem that women are often treated as treated as objects of pleasure but i think not only not only objects of pleasure because there is a, a object of vengeance because mm -hmm. catherine the nerve in tristana and in some ways uh, silvia pinal in viridiana and in some ways all the french actresses in the french uh, period Yeah. it is an ultimate revenge about men yeah. that they never get them they desire they want and all of course they think oh you are all my object on desire but they never reach them yeah. they never get them so even in the death remember bridiana even when they are dead they are like a jersey like an eternal revenge <laughs> on men even when they are dead they are deciding deciding them and and they never get here 
-hmm. So it's uh, uh, of course, uh, and uh, it's like the political freedom and in the dictatorship yeah. that always people are desire are working for political freedom and uh, cinematic. Uh, as he says, Malika Patel, equality or quality of his films, but never reach it, never get it. It's yeah. in a, in unsatisfaction on a way of of thinking on desire. And, and the real two overarching images, if you look at if Tristana also, you have her leg, but you also have the decapitated head of Fernando Rey, you know, <laughs> yeah. on the bell. That is an incredibly powerful image in the film. Maybe this image uh, could be in the Perro Andaluz yeah, or the yeah. door. This is like an image uh, flying through 1930s to <laughs> 70s. The, 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 the head as a part of a bell. Yeah, exactly. The head as a part of the bell. And uh, uh, someone has said, uh, Tathagata Chatterjee, hi. Punuel makes me feel uncomfortable. He shows acts that range from bizarre to fetishism to fantasy to disturbance to embarrassment. What is he trying to convey through these? Well, um, I think Punuel, I told before that like, for example, Orson Welles, or for example, uh, Jean Renoir, I think his cinema, he's unique because uh, he's very faithful to his spirit creators, to his own uh, obsession images. So Buñuel, I think he's uh, most uh, attent or most faithful to his own uh, uh, thinkings, than whatever uh, whatever thoughts the public of, of, of the time. I think, uh, for example, Buñuel, uh, you know, um, one of Buñuel's paradoxes, and not one of the minor ones, is that uh, uh, he consider that his greatest uh, films are like uh, objects of his own mind realized in time. So, uh, he he doesn't mind what, what whatever people think about uh, his films, but he prefers to film whatever he wants. Even when a producer in Mexican or a producer in France, uh, he contracts him and he tells Buñuel, Buñuel, you must adapt this novel, blah, 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 or whatever. Always he does whatever he wants. Always, uh, whatever the obsessive images of women, whatever the obsessive images of uh, a donkey dead, or whatever clergyman corrupted, or whatever a girl shocking uh, in a statue, or whatever, because he prefers to attend his own sexual obsessions, or political obsession, or religious obsession than what the public expected. He doesn't mind that. So I think uh, Buñuel films are a representation of his sound obsessive world. Yeah, and Enigma is a part of it. In the sense, it's very interesting how even uh, the, the scene in uh, Viridiana where he cross dresses, where he's dressing as a woman, uh, uh, you see earlier, discourse, uh, earlier uh, academic discourse around Buñuel treating all of these as perversions. But now, as times have changed and as we are looking at sexuality, etc., differently, you see where it is interesting and important to really look at, at, uh, uh, at Buñuel's films as contradictions that are in a way needed to be seen mm -hmm. as not being able to be resolved. You know? Mm -hmm. He used to walk, there's this very interesting thing where he used to walk as a nun to down Montparnasse to provoke people with lipstick and, and with... And we must remember that uh, precisely for the reason of these uh, obsessional films as these obsession images, uh, Viridiana was forbidden in Spain at the beginning. Uh, Franco was very upset with <laughs> with Luis Buñuel, and the film uh, won the Palm of Door of the Festival in Cannes. Very successful film there, and here in Spain, 
uh, the movement of dictatorship uh, was forbidding the film and was arguing against Luis Buñuel. And they hate him because of this freedom, of this revolutionary way of filming. He was forbidden <laughs> and Franco hates <laughs> Luis Buñuel here. Oh, and, and it's very important that Viridiana was forbidden here in Spain until the death of Franco in 1975. Imagine one film forbidden from 1961 until the death of our dictatorship in 1975. Yeah. So many years. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Prakash Manian 97 asks, uh, why was Louis so cynical about vagrants in Viridiana while the rich were shown to be basically unable to be indecent? While in other movies, their depiction of the bourgeoisie seemed to be different. What was different with Viridiana when he made it? Well, I think, uh... Buñuel, as uh, one of our greatest cinema movie makers that I told you, Luis Garcia Berlanga, uh, approached the idea that even the, the poetry uh, generate some kind of irresponsible, of irreverent looking at the others. Uh, in front of the ideal idea that uh, poverty makes men uh, good persons and more uh, uh, not very selfish but uh, very proud of being uh, but Buñuel and Luis Garcia Berlanga makes <laughs> movies about a poor people uh, with uh, a bad conduct and becoming so uh, with uh, trying to kill each other, trying to uh, trying to get right off the scene, trying to get the eat the food for them, uh, like a little a civil war between the, the poor people. So Viridiana, uh, it's uh, the portrait precisely of this antichrist last dinner, you remember the scene, with all poverty that Jesus Christ loves so much. Oh, let me raise the poor. The poverty will get the kingdom of heaven. And Luis Buñuel says, no, 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 not all poverty men are there. So even they are even uh, bad people as rich people, even the rich people and the bad people, they had a bad conduct. They have bad habits. They are not very Christian ones. They are not very human beings, very good human beings. They are not examples for nothing, not for rich, not for poor people. Right. And later you also see uh, that scene in Phantom of Liberty where there is that, where all, all of them uh, shit in the dining room sit in there. It's quite a powerful image of how yeah. he comes back to that. Just as you're thinking that maybe he's making the bourgeoisie seem more charming or seem less dangerous, he <laughs> does it. Um, uh, another question is, Venkat Raman, what type of genre he specializes in his movies? Among his movies, which movies considered as must watch to understand his full cinematic excellence? Is he also part of the Spanish revolution like that of the new wave of French cinema? No, I think Buñuel is a unique case. He doesn't belong to any revolution or whatever. He's a unique case of genius because precisely the reason I think it is because uh, he uh, part, a great part of his life in his younger years, and we are speaking of Nueva York, we are speaking of Paris, we are speaking of uh, many places, Mexico. So uh, he's a Spanish filmmaker that uh, is not very Spanish, I mean, 
uh, of course he takes uh, elements from Spanish culture, of course, but he travels all over the world and it's not uh, beginning a movement here, unfortunately, because Buñuel, he has no succession. He has not a, a heritage here in Spain. It is not movement. It's a, a unique case of genius than in the younger years belongs to the surrealistic movement, he is one of his most representative individual case of uh, surrealistic movements. But afterwards, Buñuel is only Buñuel cinema. There's nothing uh, connected with him uh, after him. Buñuel ends, his legacy ends with him, with his death. Unfortunately, yeah, and uh, he, it would be noteworthy to mention also how he's played with genres along his career, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. That is something that uh, Nikhil Sangotra. It is interesting to note the transformation that Viridiana goes through after that horrible incident that happened to her after that hysterical dinner party. No doubt that Buñuel has been a vocal critic of Catholicism. It's very apparent in this film, but I want you to talk about the note at which the film ends specifically as if it is trying to hint into a position that humankind cannot be redeemed and it has its darkness, which would be impossible to treat for a lack of a better word. This leads up to a very pessimistic worldview. And when it is now, after listening to the introduction mm -hmm. that Buñuel's filmmaking is like the drums with shards of the darkness becomes interesting to me. Talk about this contrasting points. Well, uh, he's right. Of okay. course, films of Luis Muñuel are not very optimistic about human race. This is, this is absolutely true. And maybe at the beginning, I think, because we are uh, talking about three periods of Buñuel, maybe the first period, the surrealistic period, in a way of a new way of dreaming, a new way of creating, a new way of imaginating worlds. We are speaking about 20s or wonderful years all over the world, the happy 20s in uh, avant-garde, just, and modern art uh, in Paris, New York, Berlin, wonderful years. And maybe there is some kind of light of expectation of uh, optimistic way because they were dreaming as Garcia Lorca, for example. Garcia Lorca in his poems, he combines the images of death, the black images of the death of uh, gypsy people or whatever, or fight of knives and blood. But they were always, as even the Salvador Dali art and uh, Luis Puñuel art at this very beginning, of course, they be an innovation way of thinking that they, we would reach a better world. But uh, even he's uh, beginning to work in different producers on producers. Um, a cinematographic of Luis Buñuel is getting darker and darker and darker. And finally, it's like the tomb of man explaining it with humoresque pictures or exaggerating characters. But he's right, Sangotra, what he says, of course, finally, uh, after uh, watching all movies of Luis Buñuel, you can continue the line through a somehow optimistic way of avant-garde cinema, an illusion of creating a new world and descending to the hell of uh, misunderstanding the human being between uh, one to another. So she, yeah. she is, is right what, what he says, yes. Yeah, and at that time there was a lot of criticism also about the fact that uh, it is quite strange then that uh, the the people Viridiana has saved and has has given uh, shelter to are the ones who then proceed to you know uh, try to rape her, which was seen very as a very cynical reading of yeah. of charity in a sense. Yeah. But like Punuel, it's also sometimes it uh, 
kindness tenderness is also like a provocative thing you find it in strange places if you look at uh, nazarene which is not shown here in the end when he is completely defeated and he is walking it's it's the act of that woman offering him a fruit something he has now denounced he is he is now delusioned with religion but it's this woman who comes and says you know may god bless you or take yeah. so kindness is also kind of provocative and uh, yeah. Even, even even kindness even the kindness with poverty yeah. turns into the own hell in earth yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, with yeah. devils and people that hates one to another yeah yeah that's maybe uh, show talk show i hope i'm pronouncing the name correct uh, show talk at the dalai lama institute oh, uh, institute ask Bunuel films remind me of Citizen Kane. Any comparison can we make of these filmmakers? Are they of any contemporary, etc.? Any relations in terms of influencing each other? Right. Awesome. Well um, I think um, the they are capable, Orson Welles and Luis Bunuel, of building a, a known world of cinema. Citizen Kane is a critic of a great mogul of media, William Randolph Hearst, and uh, it pushed the society of his time and the industry throughout uh, Orson Welles, the big cinema genius out of the system after this film. You know, after Citizen Kane, he was filming The Fourth Commandment, uh, about uh, uh, happiness between families, about the business, and the system of Hollywood the studios throughout uh, uh, of this genius of Orson Welles. And uh, the point of connection between Luis Buñuel and Orson Welles is that they are two outsiders. They are misfits. They are people that were uh, obsessed with art, with cinema. Uh, they had a camera in, in his brains, in their brains. So um, there is a connection about the brilliance of the genius, of the capacity of creating powerful images against the system. They are two anti-system movie makers and they are two of the greatest movie makers of history, precisely for his freedom above all, for his uh, capacity of creating powerful images that disturbed the elites of power. And this is very important in, in the two movie makers, and they were connected in that, and the useful, uh, the use of the black and white um, movie images too. Both showmen also in many ways, no? Yeah. Uh, throughout Vir Jeevane Shawnee, throughout Viridiana, I could see this one thing speaking to me throughout. That is the quote of Nietzsche, God is dead. Was Bunuel influenced by him? Well, maybe uh, at, at the time, uh, the years of learning of Luis Buñuel, we mean from 1917 to 1924 in students' residence, we have the, the um, institution free of learning, the institución libre de enseñanza, that uh, they were in connection with all phil French philosophers, with uh, Freudian uh, studies and psychological studies, the idea, of course, in the last of romantic philosophers, when Nietzsche says, uh, God is dead, God never existed. And in Buñuel, uh, there is like a continue answering to his uh, formation years in a Catholic school because when he goes to the resident of students, it collides, uh, it, uh, it's like a shock with what he's reading at the time in Madrid. 
So we have the contrast of the, the learning when he was a child with the brothers of the brotherhood of religion of the college. And here in Spain, the freedom of the institution free of learning. And it makes a special uh, theological way of thinking his first film, his obsession, and of course, his Nietzscheanian obsessions. Of course, he's an, an influence. Viridiana, in a way, reminded me of the point of view Bong Joon Ho adopts in Parasite and perhaps could have been influenced by it where the kindness, niceness of upper class is misplaced and is portrayed as disingenuous and the poor are not ready to be grateful as per expectations of the rich because the poor want what the rich have and given the chance will enter the house and treat themselves to it. So in a way, forcing us to share our delusions about class differences and accept the reality of haves versus have-nots. Even I, I, I think in, in other connection, of uh, Bon Ju Ho in, in Parasite is the Angel Exterminator, the exterminating angel, because uh, some people uh, close in a house during days after day after day after day begin to transform his ethics, to transform themselves and to turn on and he's right because uh, the difference between rich and poor in an extreme circumstances transform his values, changes his, their, their ethics. And it's very important, the learning from Bon Jong Hu and the learning from Luis Buñuel that uh, different social classes under pressure, under very, uh, survival circumstances changes, changes opposites. And it's very interesting observation, the connection between Buñuel and Bon Joon Ho. There is a question about the, the books, uh, a friend of us. Wow. That, uh, Could she's you recommend a, a few books? By Sagar. Well, I, I've here, I've got, of course, my last site is absolutely um, uh, the, the first book <laughs> you must read, his memoirs, uh, where he uh, speaks about all this we have we have to speak today. And another book I recommend our friend is this Ian Gibson, Luis Buñuel. It's an incredible story of his biography, his staying in Calanda, Zaragoza, Madrid, Paris in 1925, how he moves in Paris, and a film, uh, One uh, Andalusian Dog and The Age Doors, very important book. And there is another I recommend uh, our friend, the archive of Luis Buñuel with all his books, his readings, his documents, his uh, letters, it's here the Luis Buñuel in his own archive with documents, cards, uh, books he was reading and everything. And uh, a, a, a script writer very important in Spain, Juan José Porto, that is dead several months ago, the Buñuel Unknown, the Insolito Buñuel. It's very good, a very good uh, book. And another one, uh, about his obsessive images we have been talking about this morning, we have Obsession Buñuel, a very good film about his obsessive images, a catalog of his obsessive images in the three periods of his filmmaking. Uh, and the last one in Akal, this one is uh, Luis Buñuel, because the walls of Luis Buñuel Victor Fuentes, a friend of him in Mexico, in the exile in Mexico, the walls of Luis Buñuel in uh, the Mexican world transform a little his way of looking because in Mexico uh, increased his violence point of view in his films. You noticed it before, remember when you told me the violence in the Mexican period. It is here in this book. Yeah. 
and, and Victor Fuentes uh, told him some books, yes. I think we can take a, a last question because it's 6.23. Um, well, uh, maybe we can, there are two questions we can maybe reach and read in tandem. Um, when Buñuel presents us with a film like Viridiana or The Exterminating Angel, what does he expect of the audience? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, as Alfred Hitchcock or Roman Polanski, they love to shock the audiences. Yes. So uh, I think uh, like a, a man of surrealism, as a man of avant-garde, as a provocative man, even in his uh, quotidian life, he loved to shock the others, to, to terrify. So he wanted to make a scandal after a scandal. He's, he's a man of a scandal. Uh, I remember an interview when he takes, uh, you remember, a pistol and, uh, and begins to speak about how I can do with this pistol, how I can fight. Uh, yeah. Or even when he prepares his drinkings with many alcohol and, and many ice, and he begins to, oh, we are going to drink, like, like Orson Welles yeah. wanted to shock the audiences, uh, even in his own life. And he was very funny. How is he provocative <laughs> and choking and irreverent and a very important word, a rebel man, a rebel man, a rebel man, like the greatest genius of cinema. There is this very lovely encounter he describes that he has with Aragon later in Paris, Aragon being a surrealist, a pioneer surrealist. So he meets him later in Paris, in, in Paris and they are having dinner and uh, Aragon is just looking very sad and he says, you know what, the thing is, it's not possible to shock anymore. <laughs> you, know, you, say, you can't shock anymore. And yeah. the sadness, you know, even Bunuel says it, it was tender, the sadness with which he says that he can't shock anymore. And that's but a, genius, yeah. the genius always shock even further more. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly with a lot of surrealists, the idea was while uh, uh, the literary style or cinematic style, etc., is important. The uh, another uh, slightly more important thing really is to reveal the cracks in society. You know, to change ordinary life. How do you change ordinary life? And provocation seemed to be the the easiest way or the, the most sophisticated yeah. also in many ways. The way to to challenge this this look at the everyday. Yeah. Uh, one last question by Anish Srikumar. Which director in Spain today can be called as a successor of Buñuel or inspired by Buñuel? Have any great Spanish films been made based on movies by Buñuel or inspired by his movies? Um, I think there is one film someone's made on his friendship with Lorca, but I, 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 other than that, I... Maybe not, uh, not only Spaniard filmmakers, because uh, I told before, uh, really, uh, Luis Buñuel uh, didn't found uh, unsuccessfully, uh, unfortunately, in a school. Of course, I would like that Luis Buñuel here would have made in a school, but in other cinematographers, for example, uh, Woody Allen, because Woody Allen loved the discreet charm of Burgessy, one of his favorite films. And uh, Woody Allen uh, was filming always that a scene between six or seven people of media class trying to dinner together, um, arguing against one another. Woody Allen is influenced by, by Luis Buñuel, or uh, another one, maybe Gaspar Noé, or for example, David or Russell, or even Aki Kaurismaki, because Aki Kaurismaki, the favorite film of Aki Kaurismaki is The Age Door. So he, the own Aki Kaurismaki wrote uh, an article about Luis Buñuel, and, and he told all this influence came to me from Luis Buñuel and Robert Bresson. So I think for his international condition, for his universal values, for me, Luis Buñuel has more influence in other filmmakers than in Spanish filmmakers. So I noticed the influence of Buñuel in greatest filmmakers, Kaurismaki, 
Gaspar Noé, David Terrazzo, uh, of course, Woody Allen that love, uh, love Luis Buñuel. Yes. Hitchcock, all of them, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so any more questions or I think we can, uh, yeah, wrap up. Do you want to say something as a, David? Do you want to maybe just end the discussion with a few comments? One thing is how he, uh, while nothing is sacred for Bunuel, well, there is absolutely nothing sacred. He talks about destroying Picasso, Picasso's Guernica or the last uh, bomb blast in um, that obscure object of desire. Nothing is sacred. Something that houses art is not sacred. But, but there is this very uh, deep understanding also of what he doesn't find sacred. Right? There is an so religion, whether it's liturgy or whether it is uh, uh, the bourgeoisie, because at the end, it's also the bourgeoisie attacking the bourgeoisie because Bunuel is bourgeois in the end. And uh, so there is that which sort of lifts him up from, uh, you know, a kind of blind critique of institutions. There's a very informed critique. Yeah, I think the, the cinema, uh, the cinema, the movies, uh, the art, the avant-garde art, the poetry, were uh, for Luis Buñuel the ideal instruments uh, for living, for understanding the others, like some kind of a philosophy through images, through word, through poetry, yeah. uh, without music, <laughs> without music, or not very with many music, but uh, to make a uh, an extensive is some kind of uh, dreaming of uh, uh, like uh, an uh, intra world that through from inside to outside to explore the contradiction of our world. So uh, the movie of uh, Luis Buñuel render accounts to the world. I mean, uh, he makes us thinking in a critical way about our reality and this is us the message of our greatest cinema of all times, from John Ford to Akira Kurosawa, the greatest Robert Bresson, the greatest movie makers of all times, uses the cinema not only in a creative way, but to allow ourselves, to allow the public to make uh, the world more comprehensive, I think. Yeah. There's a place for nuance, like even ideology or country or nothing. Yeah. You cannot be married to any of these things. Yeah. The universal way of thinking. So that's the reason why thousands of millions of people love that wonderful cinematography. So thank you everyone for these questions and uh, Thank you, Aisa. It's a great oh, pleasure to be a new awesome. friend I have. So <laughs> love you, cinema, and we will chat, of yes. course, in, in other occasions. Thank you, everyone, for the great questions. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you, Thank you Deepti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.